Alrighty. Uh, one thing you probably noticed when you talked about Freakonomics and unintended consequences, uh, particularly of public policy, is that sometimes people, governments, groups, businesses, whomever, they make decisions of action without fully understanding the impact those decisions or policies will have. Now sometimes it's something that is completely unforeseen and it's reasonable that no one would have thought of that. Sometimes it's because they rush something through. Now, as an old man, I've been to a lot of meetings. Universities, departments love to have meetings. The departments love to have meetings. The, the actual people going to the meetings, not so much. And one thing I've noticed when we have policy decisions we have to make, sometimes before we go to the meeting, the agenda is made and a decision, a proposal has already been made. And the meeting is about do we approve this proposal or not? And where we talk about it, but we don't really have time to fully explore it. Because some, some places, some of you are members of clubs, and sometimes your clubs have to make decisions. Sometimes the person in charge has already made the decision, and they just kind of want you to say, okay, let's do that. But there, there may be other things involved which people haven't thought of. And so sometimes you make a policy decision and then the next meeting you have to have another policy decision to fix something that that decision broke that no one had expected. Sometimes these policy decisions have strange consequences, but there's not a lot you can do. You're either doing one thing or the other. There's damage one way or the other. For instance, I talked about the unintended consequences of helmet laws in Taiwan for motor scooters and motorcycles. When they enacted the law, which was to cut down on cyclist death, because when people have motorcycle accidents, the human head doesn't do well when it hits concrete or the road. And so that trauma left a lot of folks dead. So they said, wear helmets. And it did the intended thing. The number of young people who died from motor scooter or motorcycle accidents went way down. The unintended consequence, of course, was that hospitals had fewer organs for donations because the best resource for healthy organs is young people who die in accidents. And we have to make a choice. Organ donations from young people or saving the lives of young people. We have made that choice now. And that is find your organs some other way. And there are different programs doing that, sourcing organs. Actually, there's research on artificial organs has picked up. Now, that was an unintended consequence in Taiwan for helmet laws. We now know that more countries are experimenting with driverless cars. Cars that have no driver. Technically, they have a driver. It's the car. The car is, the computer on the car is driving. And they're absolutely certain that when we hit a certain percentage of driverless cars on the road, the number of people killed in accidents will be far lower. And they understand, like the US and Europe, they understand that when driverless roads, driverless cars come out, there will be fewer organ donations. So currently some companies are preparing for that. So it's no longer a unplanned for consequences. It's unintended, 
That's not the reason we want driverless cars. We want them because they're fuel efficient, they're more uh, effective, and they have fewer accidents. So lower death. We want that part. The unplanned for, unintended consequence is fewer organ donations. So we're working on artificial organs and growing organs. There's actually research on stem cells and all sorts of things. So eventually they'll just punch something up and there's your organ with your DNA. Probably not so much for my generation, but for your generation. Okay, now, one way to avoid unintended consequences is to actually discuss everything before you make a decision on the policy. And that gets us into Dewey's reflective thinking pattern. Whenever you need to make public policy or just policy decisions, follow Dewey's pattern. And Dewey gives us this five simple steps to follow. Number one, limit and define the problem and define your terms. It's amazing how many people have policy discussions where they think they're talking about one thing and the guy on the other side's talking about something else. Now sometimes this is a rhetorical gambit. They do it on purpose. Pro-life, I'm for life, implies you're pro-death if you support legalized abortion. Or I'm pro-choice, implying you're anti-choice if you're against legalized abortion. Those are, those are terms that are defined in a way to weaken the other side. But sometimes... We don't define our terms well at all. For instance, years ago, there was a big debate in Taiwan about legalized prostitution. Okay? Now, prostitution technically is legal in Taiwan for certain areas and by certain licensed prostitutes. The government used to give licenses to prostitutes. You would go down and say, Hi, I'd like to be a prostitute. And you fill out a form and they give you a license. They haven't given a new license in decades. So the licensed prostitutes are older than me. <laughs> which kind of gives them a problem making a living. Okay, there are no licensed young prostitutes. There are young prostitutes. They're illegal, working illegally. Okay, now there's a big debate about those prostitutes and whether we should take the license away or we should expand it so that more people could have licenses. And this news. Was it made the international news. CNN actually had stories about legal prostitutes in Taiwan. And some people said, we shouldn't legalize prostitution. And they were actually talking about different things. For instance, when the people in favor of legal prostitution were saying, we should legalize more <coughs> prostitutes, yay! Uh, they weren't talking about all prostitutes. They were talking about consensual prostitution. Taiwan at that time, actually before that time, there was a problem in Taiwan with teen prostitution or underage prostitution or um, sexual exploitation of children. These are not as serious a problem today because we have dealt with these problems very effectively. But it, there was a time when when people said prostitution, they were talking about child prostitutes. So when people said, I think prostitution should be legal, other people were hearing child prostitutes are cool. But that's not what they were actually saying. Or are we talking about prostitutes of any gender? So when someone says prostitution should be legal, are they talking about just women? 
Most of you, when I say legal prostitutes, you think of women. Some of you think of guys. Some of you think of gay guys. And some of you think of puppies, and you should stop that. <laughs> but there is a factor. So first, we limit the problem so that we can talk about it in a reasonable time and we also define the terms. So when I talk about legal prostitution or when I talk about legalization of drugs, which drugs am I talking about? What schedule? Am I just talking about marijuana or am I talking about marijuana, heroin, LSD, and coffee? So which drugs are you talking about? Okay. So first, limit and define the terms so that you can have policy decisions that are agreed upon by all factors and they understand the terms and how it's being done. Then we analyze and evaluate the problem. You have to look at the history of the thing. You can't just look at it today. You need to ask questions, well, how was this handled before? How is this being handled in other countries? that have similar or dissimilar conditions for us. If we're talking about legal prostitution or legalizing drugs, let's take a look at countries where it's legal. And we ask questions of how would that work out in Taiwan? Are there enough similarities to their conditions or are they so dissimilar it doesn't work? Why is prostitution illegal here for the most part? Why are drugs, why is marijuana illegal in Taiwan? It is illegal, right? Yes, it is. People get to go to happy, happy prison. It's not really happy because of marijuana. Okay. Why? Why is it illegal here? There's very good evidence that Taiwan is one of the first places on this planet where humans cultivated marijuana. The oldest archaeological evidence of marijuana use is Taiwan. So why is it illegal now? Since they used it so long ago. There's many reasons for that, okay? Why is alcohol not illegal? Why is it legal to have alcohol or tobacco, which are drugs, but not other drugs? So we have to ask these questions, okay? And we come up with the answers. We do the history. We look at everything we can and analyze and evaluate it. That should take the longest part of your discussion. Not, oh, it's illegal now. That must be good. Okay. Move on. That, that's not enough. You really need to look at every aspect of an issue in order to determine what are the conditions. All right? Once you've done that step, then you go to step three. Establish criteria or standards by which solutions may be judged. Whether we can determine solutions are good or bad. Too many people, they start the discussion with, well, I think it should be illegal. There, we're done. No, don't have preconceived solutions. First, go through your definitions, evaluations, then establish standards, criteria by which you can judge this is going to be a good thing or a bad thing. And you'll look at public good, you'll look at personal good, you'll look at how effective things are. What are your standards? Once you have your standards by the personal, your personal ones and the group goals. For instance, you, sir, have values. Or, I don't know, do you? Do you have any ethics? Are you an ethical person? Yeah. Maybe. Notice how he said that, yes, like it's a question, I'm not sure. I'm positive you have values. Now whether your values suck or not, we have to talk of it. But you have personal values. All right, And some of your personal values are in line with the group's values. 
most people in the group share certain of your values. Certain of your values most people may not share. Okay? In the final assignment for last semester, I asked you to do an informative speech. Some of you gave an informative speech that wasn't really an informative speech. It was a persuasive speech. For instance, if at the end of your speech you said, Yay, gay marriage! That's not an informative speech. That was persuasive. Okay? Informative speeches just give us information. All right? Don't worry. You're going to get a chance to do opinions and rants and persuasives. And part of that is you know your values. Some of you, for instance, are in favor of legalizing gay marriage. Not civil union, but marriage. Same as other straight people. Some of you might be opposed to it. It's based on your personal values. Now, some values can be separated from us, and we can say, well, that's my personal value, but here's the group value. So your standards need to work for the group and for your check your personal goals as well. Once you've got those standards that everyone's agreed upon, then we go to four. And that's the only time we start proposing solutions. What should we do? What are the possible solutions we think might work? Okay? And then we evaluate those solutions that are based on promoting individual and group values we evaluate them based upon the criteria. And from evaluating them, we select the best solution. Now, I'm in a group. I want my values to be the ones that are chosen. But I can actually understand sometimes I might disagree with you not because of a universal value, but a personal value. We have to discuss that. Sometimes we compromise so that the group has the best solution. Okay. The gay marriage debate is similar to that. There are personal values and there are group values. All right. There are people, for instance, who live in countries where gay marriage is legal, who voted for legalizing gay marriage even though their personal religious views are that it's a sin to be gay. But they understood that that's my personal value, that's a religious value. My religion is not the only religion in this country. I shouldn't push it on everyone. I just don't do that thing myself. So if I don't think gay marriage is right, I just don't get gay married. Yay. Okay. And that's an example, by the way, that's not my personal values. My personal values are very different from that. Okay. So then we establish our criteria, we propose solutions, and we evaluate them based on our, our values that we agreed upon and choose the best. And Dewey's reflective thinking pattern has been used in many public policy discussions. And it has been found to be very effective at lowering unintended consequences. Because if you do all this, you're less likely to have something happen that you didn't foresee. You discuss it. And you've made a choice based on the group values that are happening. Now, of course, there will still be some people who might disagree with your policy decisions. And that's where you will do further discussion later. But you will find that your policy decisions are less likely to have challenges and problems if you follow Dewey's reflective thinking pattern. Some of the Freakonomics examples you guys have been talking about today they didn't do that. They just had some idiot 
come up with an idea based on political things. Catering. Some politicians do a thing called cater to the base. So they have a base support that has certain values and beliefs and they cater to them even though they know that's not really going to do what they say it's going to do. For instance, I might cater to a homophobic group, a base that is predominantly homophobic, by saying I'm against gay marriage, even though I know that solution's not going to do good. Or I might cater to xenophobes. Xenophobes are people who are afraid of foreigners or, or don't like foreigners. I say I'm going to build a wall because it's a big policy that they can see and they can agree with even though I know that's not going to solve immigration issues. Many of them. Thank you. We must stop now. Bye-bye.